you for, for free with feedback from all of the studios. And I think that was a huge success because if you're a young person and you want to be an animator and you've never had any feedback uh, on your portfolio, particularly from a professional person that you had eight or nine studios giving you feedback over a two day period of time, you would take that deal every day on Sunday, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So that was amazing. Then we, we had speakers like Peter Ramsey from, um, from Spider-Man uh, Across the Spider-Verse, uh, as well as Kim Powers, who was his, his co-producer uh, on that film, uh, who actually went to Howard University, which I'm, I'm proud of. Um, and, and so uh, we do a panel discussions that take place. It's one hour. Um, we have three to five people on the panel. And most of uh, the speakers uh, do come from the studio, so you actually get to hear from the professionals that are actually doing the animation jobs. In fact, uh, Mr. Uh, Floyd Norman came, and so we were really proud of that. But honestly, I think that there's a sincerity in the industry um, to want to reach out. I know that we had one studio partner that told us, yeah, we really want to make sure that we hire more uh, ethnic talent because we have a ton of content that's coming uh, through the pipeline that's content that's ethnic in nature, and we want uh, people of color working on these projects. And so there is a genuine outreach, and we see that every year over year. Um, I think, um, you know, people talk about AI, for example, and the threat of AI, but I think that, you know, if AI is going to be a part of our ecosystem, which it probably most definitely will, um, I don't think that as a creator you need to be concerned about it. Yes, I think it is a powerful enabler in some way, but I think also it doesn't necessarily have to be a threat. Um, there's just some things that AI can't do that, that humans do. And so I, I see that every day in the work that we do. So we're just like really proud of how the industry has embraced Afro animation. And what we feel that we do is we just kind of really act as a bridge between the movie studio community and in black creators, one, um, I think what we've been able to do is enable black animators to know each other. Prior to Apple Animation, there was no conference. So uh, the conference brings black animators together to network with each other, to know each other, to talk about important subject matter relating to the industry. But also there is that, that bridge that we build that connects um the animators, black animators with the movie studios and vice versa. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that's really interesting that I've noticed is that even though the organization is called the Afro Animation, your membership and those that attend is extremely diverse. And it is a really is. inclusive conference. Um, so to, to have 4,900 people online all over the world in your first go, that was pretty impressive. So if we can bring Kwame back up on screen as well. Um, you know, we, we talked during our prep session about the need for individuals to find their tribe. And one of the things that Kwame was saying was that as they bring young people up through SCAD, um, they are making sure that they help them to do that. Kwame, can you hear us? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want I wanted okay. to give you a, a chance to talk a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing at SCAD with some of the some of the young talent that's coming out. And you were talking about an emphasis on on 2D and where you were focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at SCAD we have uh, concentrations uh, in 3D uh, technical uh, 3D animation. Uh, 2D animation and, and story and concept. So where I lie in is with the uh, story and concept uh, and also to degree 2D animation. Um, our focus at SCAT is really excellence, yeah? Uh, and can we uh, um, uh, give these uh, students an opportunity uh, to really grow in a positive oriented, oriented environment and prepare them ready for jobs? Our focus really, really is on getting them jobs and preparing them for the, uh, you know, the, the job environment. And that's where people like uh, Keith might really come in. In fact, Keith was recently at SCAD and really inspired our, our students uh, in terms of like what it means to be a professional, what it means to network, uh, and how to how, you know how to go about um, you know uh, uh, your dealing about uh, you know uh, fine tuning your resume and networking uh, with uh, professionals. Um, and so our focus really is is is, is and is is uh, getting our students to really like hone and develop. Uh, 
their voices in a professional manner. Um, and we, we bring in professionals from all over the world. We have speakers come in uh, virtually and, and in person and really um, have our, our students really have that uh, exposure to what it's like to work in the industry um, and, uh, and opportunities as internships. We have a very strong uh, uh, career, uh, career and alumni uh, success department. And that's all about networking with not only our alumni, but also um, the networks in the industry uh, across the world. So our real focus is really like how can we help as young people tell their stories and give them that professional edge so that when they get out, they have the best opportunities to, uh, to get work and get jobs. And, uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, working with Afro animation and other, other, other numbers like that is really what we do is trying to really, uh, like keep saying, be that bridge to get the students from, uh, the training environment to actually getting jobs and, 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 and focusing on having them tell their own stories. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great to, um, it's you know it's 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 great to get a job, but it's also good, great to get a job that now you're actually a job you're enjoying, and that's why our students they're really um, uh, we really try to push that passion, like you know really find your niche, really get something that you're good at, get your foot in the door, and eventually you will get those uh, those ideal jobs. Uh, story and counsel, for example, is one of the most competitive jobs, and so we tell our students, well, think of it, uh, think of the when you get out to the work world as being like Batman with your utility belt, and so you have multiple skill sets. And let's get one that gets you in the door and then others that, uh, you know, will help you navigate your way through the system and eventually you will get that job. But it really is about like, you know, maximizing your opportunities by building your skill sets. Um, and uh, eventually we'll get those, uh, you know, ideal jobs that you want and in, 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 in bringing your voice to the uh, to the world. So, yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Kwame. I, I want to give Keith the last word. So, uh, Keith, what I, you know, you, the one thing that you didn't tell us is uh, when is the next Afro Animation uh, Conference? Sure. Um, it's April 10th through the 12th uh, in Burbank, California, 2024. Um, so we're very excited. We're ramping up. We're working on it day and night. Uh, it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, we have some new activations that we've never, things that we've never done before. Um, one is called a Forward Awards, which is a, a, a dinner event. It's kind of like our Oscars for Black animation. Uh, yes, you have different uh, sort of general market award ceremonies or you have award ceremonies that are Black, but they don't necessarily uh, laser focus on um, animation. Um, IP feature film short series. And so this new Ford Awards is going to be specifically, um, to highlight and to amplify, um, that those IPs, but also to acknowledge, um, the individuals that, uh, play an instrumental role in bringing those things to market. We're, uh, doubling down on, um, our focus on students. And so we're curating two events. One is, uh, an internship corner which um, really prevents like, you know, when you think about like a student having to go through and search Google for all the internships that are all over the place and apply for all of that, the internships we've been working on research for the last month is going to bring every internship that we can uncover um, in the studio space and the streaming space and the gaming space uh, and spatial computers um, in other uh, verticals. And so all of that Im information uh, in terms of internships, apprenticeships, um, fellowships, and mentorships will be aggregated in that, that one spot that's never been uh, done before in the way that, that we're doing it. Um, student networking events um, that are very separate from uh, the general networking events. And so there's a lot of celebration, but Certainly a lot of important conversations uh, and workshops that will take place that will focus on skill building. You know, Kwame is absolutely right. You know, not everybody necessarily uh, will get an animation job. So let's look at jobs that are still within or adjacent to the animation space. So we had a conversation with Paramount um, Consumer Products yesterday. And they were talking about all of these other jobs that are not specifically, for example, a 2D or 3D job, but they may be illustration, they're freelance jobs, they're graphic designers. And so what we want to try to do is that for information of what we will do is uh, shed the light on these other opportunities. Uh, you know, maybe it could 
take you a little while before you actually land that first professional career job that you want, wherever that might be in the creative economy. But there's other things that you can be doing to develop and keep your skills uh, being built as you as you go for that goal. So we're just taking Afro animation to a whole new level. And we're really, really excited about what's coming up in 2024. Well, I, I want to thank you. And I think you should be excited. The focus on students is something that SMPT is really, really focusing on uh, in these last few years. So we, we are excited to uh, have the opportunity to have both of you here to join us. And we look forward to working with you both uh, in the future on a few more things. So thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Keith. You guys take care. And uh, now we're going to... Uh, we're going to get a chance to talk to some of your contemporaries uh, with uh, Shofela Coker and uh, Ingrid DeBeer. But first, we're going to take a look at their groundbreaking uh, installment in the anthology Kinzazi Moto. Uh, they have a feature called Morimi. All right, we can bring the house lights back up. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I don't know if you liked it as much as I did, but right now we want to bring to the stage the director and illustrator, Shofella Coker, and the producer and uh, technologist, Ingrid De Beer, uh, all the way from South Africa. Have a seat. Uh, I am going to. Do we have another microphone or we just pass the mic? Is that one charged? Testing one, two. We'll grab one more. In, we'll grab one more in just a second. So uh, we'll start with with uh, Shof as we get started here. So tell us a little bit about the film itself and and the origin of the story. Listen, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Renard, for inviting both of us to this event. Uh, it's a real pleasure to share with you uh, a film that's very near and dear to our hearts. Um, Morami is a story that inspired me as a child. Um, it's a Nigerian myth. It's the story of a woman that sacrificed her son to save her village. And it's a story that stayed with me since I was a kid and has always raised lots of interesting questions for me. And the woman herself has always inspired me because of her courage, uh, her abilities, her sensibilities in the story. Um, and when I was given this opportunity to develop a story for uh, Triggerfish and Disney Plus for this series, um, it, the idea was to develop um, a story that had African futurist sensibilities, a hopeful story. And for some reason, uh, this story called to me as one that I could possibly um, adapt and turn into something uh, that fit the brief, of course, but um, fit a sensibility that I was thinking of at the time. Um, it was during the pandemic, and I was actually spending a lot of time with my parents, so I was thinking a lot about home and my relationship to this older generation of people. Um, and more of me came about with this, this, this thinking, this feeling of wanting to reach back for home. Um, and so, of course, the film that you've just seen is about a mother and a son, uh, Morami, who's a particle physicist in our story. Uh, it's a continuation 
What if Morami had the technology to travel to the spirit world to save her son that she had sacrificed, to rescue him from this realm? Um, so I thought this was a good place to pick up the story. Um, and yeah, here we are, and you guys have seen it. Um, it took about a year of development and a year working with Lucan Studio. Uh, a great pleasure of mine to work with this studio in South Africa um, that I had seen their work previously before. And uh, once Triggerfish, the parent production company, had paired me up with Lucan in, in Cape Town, uh, I, I was just over the moon and uh, overjoyed with the collaboration with them because uh, I consider Ingrid my friend now over a year working with her and knowing her over that year. Um, and yeah, a beautiful story and a beautiful collaboration came from it. So I'm, I'm glad you guys could all see that today. Yeah, I think during during our call, it was it was really really inspiring to see how your relationship uh, really budded between between you guys as well as Verna, who's not here, uh, and and the the idea of this being essentially an all African production and making sure that it was done that was important to you and so here's Lucan Lucan TV in South Africa doing wonderful things and so you Ingrid started more on the technology side of the world and then you became a producer here so tell us a little bit about that journey to where you got involved with the film uh oh are we on let's, let's switch microphones <laughs> Thank you so much, and it's a divine pleasure to be here at this fine institution. I just want to point that out firstly. And um, interestingly, as we walked in, I uh, pointed to the SMPTE logo. Bring it a little bit closer. There you go. Is that a little bit better? All right. I pointed to the uh, logo, and I told Shof in uh, earlier point in my career when I uh, worked as a post-production manager in um, broadcast television, the uh, standards were listed on my desk and every time we went through QC for tra channel submission, for color space, for audio, I uh, was starkly reminded of how and where to course correct. So I feel quite at home in, in this specific room today. Welcome. You are at home indeed. <laughs> so so the the film itself we we talked about a number of things we talked about the specific look how did you guys land on that particular look for this film and, and ingrid was being humble uh I, I wish she talked a little bit more about her journey and i hope she will still um but yes i will jump on that question when i'm you know more me is a collaboration with lucan again of course um I am a character designer by background and an art director, so a lot of Moremi is a continuation of that exploration of uh, a lot of personal ideas and expressions and illustration in particular. Um, but working with our art director, who's uh, Vian van Bergen, he's the studio art director for Lucan and one of the partners, uh, was transformative because let me tell you that our director really cares about uh, capturing light and, and photography in a way that uh, I don't know many artists do. Um, so he's got a more filmic um, understanding of animation in particular. So that marriage um, with my more graphic sensibilities I think led to a very unique um, look and feel for the film. Um, I'm very inspired by um, Nigerian Southwestern, in particular, Southwestern Nigerian printmaking and sculpture practices. So those tend to, those sensibilities tend to come out in my work. Um, so they're very graphic in particular. Um, and VN, like I said, um, tends to be more filmic. So how do you get those two things to sit together? For instance, the 3D characters and the 2D backgrounds, which are Actually, you can see in the backgrounds, a lot of textures and patterns are woven into the paintings. Um, so for instance, with the 3D characters, one way we tried to make them sit and, and marry well with each other was to build in the patterns and the textures into, for instance, the, the spec of their skin tones. Um, and for instance, in the penumbra, the, the, the 
uh, boundary between the shadow and the light of their faces or their bodies, uh, you could see a little bit of pattern in, in there as well. And of course, the, the designs are also made to be a little bit more graphic. Um, and of course, the interaction with the camera as well and the light uh, was something that we paid very special attention to. Lots of uh, tests to make sure that that got right. Um, and, and a lot of very interesting anecdotes like, uh, you know, we had to make sure we tested them for multiple different light conditions. Uh, you can see in the film there's, you know, intense darkness, there's twilight, there's uh, bright daylight, morning shots. And of course those skin tones have to hold up <laughs> to all that stuff. So yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of fun actually. That, that's what's interesting because uh, the way that we met is I watched the film uh, and I watched the film at the recommendation of, uh, of Kwame because Kwame and I, we, 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 we share, uh, you know, things that we find and discover. And so he said, well, have you seen the anthology? And I said, no, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I think I was just finishing up my dad, the bounty hunter. Uh, and, and so I was really impressed with what they did with, uh, the texture of hair in that, that particular one. So I was watching it and I, and I got to Marimi and, Generally, you know, if you're watching it on Netflix or something like that, it goes directly into the credits and, and then it skips the credits and goes to the next uh, episode. Your episode is in, I think it's episode three. So it's right in the center of what's happening. And so it started to go to the next episode. I paused it. I stopped. I said, I need to know who made this. I, I have to go back. I wanted to find out who made it. I wanted to know everything about it. And then I reached out to Werner. Just, I, I just reached out to him. I, I said, I, I need to know more about this. What I wanted to know, not just who the artist and the director was, but I also wanted to know about the pipeline and the process that went into actually everything that Shof just described. So I know a lot of that fell on you. So Ingrid, tell us a little bit about the pipeline and some of the some of the newer things that you were adding into that pipeline to make this happen. Absolutely. Um, so I want to first make one sentimental statement. Um, as a producer functioning on the continent of Africa, and specifically in South Africa, um, what I also mentioned to you on our call is as is the case with many underrepresented communities, especially in media production and creation, we have a bit of a chip on our shoulder. Um, we often question whether we're good enough, um, and that being good enough is, also relates to our pipeline and our technology. Um, there's obvious financial barriers to that, uh, operating in a currency that's incredibly weak um, against products that's generally dollar-based or euro-based. These are major considerations when you're like us, a boutique production studio. We're not a factory. Uh, we would like to think that we're a creative hub for directors and the backbone ultimately is our pipeline, is our technology and how do we get from point A to point Z with artists and directors like Shove. To specifically answer your question, on the back of the pandemic, we knew the opportunity at hand as African creators and as an African production studio, we knew what was at stake. Um, this felt like a call to action. Um, yes, we've sharpened, sharpened our saw artistically and technically servicing um, global advertisements. We, we know the tech is there. We know the artistry is there. The problem we faced as a boutique or as a smaller studio is the question was, can we accommodate a well, hybrid pipeline where we can level the playing field, right? Where our artists in studio are as included and as hands-on in the actual making of as our director who's been based in Atlanta and so many of our collaborators um, based uh, spread across the world, but specifically the continent of Africa. So barring the fact that we had a failed attempt, speaking very truthfully, with our very first cloud-based service provider for our data, we quickly um, course corrected there, thankfully. We also deployed a brand new pipeline um, day, the very first day of production animation. That's petrifying for any studio and especially for a studio of, of our size. Um, 
And our key, again, vision with that and the, the investment with that was to make sure that every single artist is equally included, doesn't matter where in the world they're based. But, you know, when you have a fully functional pipeline, one that actually works, you serve your end product, you serve creativity. Um, and yes, as business people, you serve your bottom line. You get to hire highly skilled people and they can focus on their craft. They don't have to focus on, oh, the elbow grease of, oh, is this file version correct? Has, is the director looking at the most recent, recent or correct version of an asset? Um, so, Yes, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, because you put in place uh, essentially a, a cloud-based virtual pipeline that allowed you to work globally. And then you brought it all back together. And, and I, I don't think of Lucan Studios as petite simply because your output is large. It's very large. And I think that that says a lot about the way that you operate and the efficiency that you bring technically. One of the things that you also mentioned was that you wanted to make the tech transparent so that the artist can be the artist. And that's, you know, that's what SMPT tries to do as well. So I, I think I think it's wonderful. Uh, another thing that was a part of this whole thing was the the music in the way that you use the music to move the imagery forward as well as the story. So tell me a little bit about how the decision was made to use traditional Yoruba instrumentation along with electronic music and instrumentation to bring together not just the sound effects and the, and the, the you know, the, the sound sweetening aspect of this, but to be an, a character in itself within the story. No, thank you. It's still not working. Don't worry. I will take it. It's just not working. Uh, thank you for asking that question, Renard. Um, audio and, and score and music and storytelling for me are uh, hand in hand with images. Um, and on the back of what Ingrid was talking about, uh, it was an international collaboration, even with that. Um, our music composer, the, the supervisor for the series was actually our composer as well. His name's James Frank, uh, James Bassing White. Um, but we also had two other composers that worked on the film in Olaulu Lawal and Femi Koya. Um, Olaulu was based in South Africa as well, but, uh, or sorry, Olaulu was based in Norway and Femi was based in South Africa. So we did have to, you know, figure out a way to work um, across borders as well in that sense. And of course, I was based in Atlanta. Um, but for me, uh, the combination of traditional Yoruba instrumentation and electronic music, again, goes hand in hand with the ethos of the film. This idea of traditional uh, spiritual and the material, uh, traditional and future. Um, and for me, I, I believe that music has a place in striving for a hopeful future and striving for uh, a sense of healing, actually. And that's what the film is about, is that music can heal people, right? Um, there's vibrations that have this capacity to do that. And so these tra traditional instruments are a part of my history, right? Uh, a part of my culture. And I want to show that they have that capacity as well, because I know lots of musicians and music in my history that have done that for me. But these uh, musicians in my history, like Fela, like, uh, you know, Femi Kuti, his son, uh, Peter Waifo, these, these are all <laughs> musicians that have been doing just what I, I talked about. They've been combining traditional instrumentation with electronic music because they understand that idea that music and imagery have the power to inspire uh, lots of things, rebellion, humor, celebration, in a very specific way. So I wanted the film to speak to that conversation as well. So uh, I don't know whether we achieved it, you know, no, perennial I, you, you doubts are here. But. <laughs> you definitely <laughs> achieved it. You definitely. Yeah, thank you. I walked away, you know, it, it's funny because I met you as Shof. And then when you sent me your bio and, and I saw that your name was Shofela, I, I, I did the same. I, I was like, okay. There's only one fella. There's only one fella. And, I, and of course, that took me back. And I, I said, okay, there was, for me, there, there must have been some sort of connection to this. Because even, you know, I, 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 I think, like I said, the music became a character, you know. And so 
all of that being put together, Ingrid, that's your job to make sure all of that flows properly through the process to get to this final film. So tell us a little bit more about the process and don't be shy, you know, be, tell, tell us a little bit more about the good and the bad of what you were trying to do and, and, and how you were able to do that in a relatively short amount of time for an animated film. Hello. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so, um, obviously, short film fake, short film making comes with its own set of challenges. Time always, I, I think, being one of them. Music, in particular, from day one, from the very first time that I met Shof, um, was vitally important to what he wanted to achieve in his artistic vision. Um, and I think from day one. Oh, we had just, and I love this because this is part of the production process. It's also all the fun little human things, right? We had a, a Spotify playlist by Shof playing in our studio in Cape Town on repeat, just so that all the guys on the ground could get a sense of what is this director thinking about? What is he hearing? What is he swaying to? And, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's, Yes, we're all African, or we're all African by nationality, rather. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that just because we're in South Africa, we know what Shof ex exactly what Shof wanted to achieve. So referencing, and especially when it came to music and visual, was vitally important. And experimentation, right? Even in animatic phase, um, I myself am a musician. So that's somewhere where I think from day one, we just kind of held hands. And it was a beautiful collaboration because I, I think I understood what Shof's desire was as a musician. I'm a, I'm a drummer, right? So anything rhythm, it just, it just activates for me. And, and it, it, to me, that was one of the f most, I guess, rewarding gifts as a production person, um, you know, to actually walk that walk alongside my wonderful director. I mean, remember our, our, relationship was technically a blind date. We were placed together and one of our other, you've met my uh, partner, Vanner. So initially, just a back end story about the process of Maremi, Vanner and I were supposed, well, we intended to actually flip roles. Uh, I was supposed to be our financial producer and he was supposed to be our production producer. I met Shof once, I picked up the phone and I said, Vanner, you've got to swap with me, I've got to work with this man. And to be honest, the greatest appeal wasn't only his excellence, which I could immediately see in his, in his portfolio, but it was that, that music factor um, which permeated into everything. It permeated into huh, character animation briefs doing CG tests, still in clay models. Were the spirit giants moving in rhythm? Was that on brief? Um, oh, the edit, obviously, you know, taking from animatic through to final cut, was there a, and I quote Shof, lyricism to every single visual and every single aspect that permeates it into what we now see as the final visual? What a divine pleasure. I, you know, you can feel it. You feel... You feel the rhythm of the music. You feel the, the connection between all of the individuals who put their heart and soul into it within that particular piece for, for 12 minutes and I think 13 seconds. You feel what's, what's the story itself. And, and I, I just want to thank you both for being here. I want to thank you both for putting that work out into the world. I love the fact that you represented Africa in that way. But what I think I love the most is this relationship that is developed between the two of you. And I know you're going to be working together more. And I should say the three because Vernon's not here, but the three of you. Uh, and I do look forward to your next thing, you know. So so thank you both so, so very much. Thank you for having us. I'm going to move these chairs out of the way. Oh, yeah, oh, thank you very much. We'll just get this one out of here. We'll put them over here to the side. And uh, 
can stack it right there. That'll be fine. <laughs> and then we are going to bring up is uh is Lynn on? She's not on yet. Okay, hold on one second. Let me see if we can find uh our next guest. She is calling in from uh from Australia. So it's very early in the morning for her. So hold on just one moment. Question? Uh, okay. Uh Shof and uh and Ingrid, I think we may have some questions for you uh while we track down our last guest. First, thank you. I loved your story. I'll wait until you get centered. But I want to know whether the story that you told is pre-Christian, and how long has that story been going on in Nigeria? And I ask the question because I see some parallels between the story of Christ and his birth and the story that you told. For example, she offered her heart to her son. In the story of the Christ child, God offered his son the body of Christ, the crucified Christ. Then you said that she offered her son to, quote, save the world. When you think about the Christ story, you see saving the world. So I'm wondering whether, because we know that there are influences, cultural influences, and we know that there are universal stories that all cultures tell. So I would like to know whether your story is pre-Christian. So, okay, it works. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the simple answer is it is. The, the original myth is one of the earliest stories of the Yoruba people. So, um, Moremi herself uh, was the second queen of Ife. Um, it's from the 15th century, so it, it is pre-Christian. Um, I could see the obvious parallels you're talking about. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe that's just a, a common thread with humanity. Lots of myths tend to have common threads. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Joseph Campbell. He talks a lot about that. Um, but yes, the simple answer is no. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, what's up? Uh, I'm a student at Morehouse College. I'm Chris Sellers. I'm a freshman, a pre cinema major, and I go, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I have a question about just, I'm interested in getting into the animation industry. I've been really interested in character design and just writing stories since I was young. I really want to put stuff either in film or on television. Do you have any advice for me in just like getting into the field, like with how my life is going right now? Because I'm, I, I really want to <laughs> just do what you're doing, you know, like, <laughs> so any advice at all? Of course. And thanks for the question and thanks for attending this. I would say that's the first step is exposing yourself to events like this. You know, the internet is a great tool, but it's actually always worthwhile to meet uh, creators and do networking in person, even as a student. Um, and I'll give uh, Ingrid a chance to answer you as well, because she's way smarter than I am and <laughs> she does this stuff all the time. Uh, as an artist, I would say, you know, as a young person, it's been a while since I've been in your, your spot, um, but it's easy to get anxious about the working world and getting into it. Um, I would say try and make sure you're intentional about it. Um, don't rush in a sense. Like you do want to get that job right out of university to support yourself and all that stuff, but make sure you focus on your craft a lot and um, take your time with, you know, trying to find the spot that you end up at because that's where you will, that's where you can foster your craft, right? And that's what you want as an artist most and first and foremost. Um, but Ingrid, do you want to add to that? I think uh, Shof actually nailed most of it. But Chris, what I, what I want to add, when you are in a position when you feel comfortable to start reaching out to studios or collectives who you admire, firstly, let your work do the talking um, and be as specific as possible in terms of why do you find that specific studio uh, appealing to yourself um, and, and what it is that you feel you can offer. You'd be amazed um, the people who skim and read those emails, they actually pay attention 
and it's frightening to put yourself out there, but keep going. A lot of doors are going to close, but a lot of doors will open as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Riley Foster. I'm a second year documentary filmmaking student at Spelman College. Um, and I just had a comment with a follow up question. Um, so ever since my African diaspora in the world class that I took at Spelman my freshman year, um, I've been inclined to disprove the myths, um, you know, about African spirituality that, you know, it's demonic and, um, you know, that hoodoo and voodoo and all of that are like from the devil. Um, and seeing this animation gave me inspiration to see how animation can really be a mover in shifting narratives about our history. And my question for uh, both of you is, how do you feel about using animation like this um, that really show the beauty of African spirituality and just of African cultures to um, challenge the false narratives that have been perpetuated throughout history about African spirituality. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Hey, Riley. Lovely question. Um, I'm going to comment as a, as a filmmaker and as a producer. Um, I feel now is the moment, and it's people like us who are being called to action. And I know you're still a student, but it's people like you too. Your turn, your chance is coming and your head is already in the right space. I'm someone who makes ideas with creators like Shof and with one day creators like yourself. And for me, from a technical perspective, the best act of service I can provide is to create films of quality that will stand the test of time. Um, I, I'll, I'll hand over to Shof to speak more as a creator. No, I don't know if I could follow that. Um, <laughs> I, I would just encourage you to try and find this film I saw recently um, called Mamiwata. So M-A-M-I and then Wata, W-A-T-A. So it's a Nigerian film that was uh, released last year. It's black and white. Um, I think it won the Best Cinematography Award at the Sundance Film Festival last year. Uh, it's gorgeous. Um, also has an amazing soundscape, uh, but it's, it's a film about exactly what you just asked. Um, it's a film that challenges you to um, see this town that's grappling with the change of uh, modernity, basically. So um, it's a town that uh, has a, a voodoo princess, priestess, and she's supposed to venerate this Mamiwata, the goddess of the water. Um, yeah, it deals with a lot of those ideas that you're talking about, and I, I would invite you to watch that to further your understanding of that notion. Um, I, I'm one that believes in understanding every angle, and in this cultural aspect, in, in fact, for instance, for me, I'm Yoruba, so that would be the Ifa belief system. Um, I was raised Catholic. Um, I'm not religious anymore, but a lot of my family members uh, do believe in both Ifa and uh, Catholicism, and I do believe that both have value and can coexist exactly. And they've been proven to have done so in the Caribbean and Brazil. So, uh, simple answer is yes, they can coexist. And I hope you make some really amazing art about it yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you both. And, um, we will, uh, we will actually now show a trailer from the movie Friendship, and after which we will speak with the writer, director, and, uh, and technologist that put that film together, Lynn Tam. So let's go ahead and play the, uh, the trailer. <laughs> Uh, do we have Lynn? Lynn, can you hear me? 
I can't hear you. I'm here. Hello. Oh, hello. I can hear you as well. Hold on one second. We're going to pull you up on the big screen. Oh, I'm going to move okay. to the other side of the stage <laughs> and sit over here. I've been on that side all day, so we're going to move over. We'll throw off the edit. So, so how are you doing? How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for waking up early to be with us. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't miss it. I'm very <laughs> excited about our conversation. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now. We talked a little bit about how this film came to be, but tell us a little bit about you. Sure. So um, my background is actually in technology. So I've worked for a whole bunch of startups, um, big, you know, corporations, etc. But it was actually, you know, during COVID that I felt that I just needed to hit the reset in my life. And I had stories that I wanted to tell. And starting from there, I started thinking about all the stories I wanted to tell. And I just felt that I wanted to play a bigger role in contribution to society by telling stories. And that's how I started with this short film, Friendship, for it. Yeah, well, I think a lot of us were re-inspired or, or reignited or some people say rewired during the uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So so one, I want to thank you for the film. And those of you who haven't had a chance to take take a look, it is available on YouTube as well as uh, was it friendship? Tell me tell me the website again. It's friendshipshort.com as well. Okay, friendshipshort.com as well. It is a, a good uh, use of seven minutes of your life if you get the chance to take a look at it. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> so coming from the technical side, how did you make the switch to being a creative? A lot of people want to know about that path. Sure. So um, I've always, you know, dabbled on the side in um, animation and just, you know, writing scripts, storytelling. I've always studied about how to create great stories from, you know, from, I would say, script format first. And I would call myself a hustler in some sense because I was, had a tech job, but on the weekends I would be taking writing classes for script and filmmaking. And I think that really helped a lot because then I met a lot of other individuals who were inspired to tell their own stories. And I kind of found my tribe, you know, uh, taking weekend classes and then doing uh, meetup events for filmmakers at that time. And I think it really helped because, you know, as I mentioned, when COVID started, the height of COVID started, it really just pushed me to take that leap of faith. It's like I've gathered all of this information. I've done all of this stuff. The next step is to take action. And I think that was the, the final thing that really made a difference. Well, you know, you and I talked about some of the things that are important to you. And we were talking about your feelings about representation of Asian uh, Asian people in general in animation and how important that was to you. So tell us a little bit about what was important to you with friendship and why you wanted to make sure that this story was told, but also the representation aspect and angle of everything. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I wanted to create friendship for the reason that I did not see a lot of female Asian lead characters um, in animation. You just don't see it a lot at all. And usually when you do see it, they're always either having some kind of martial arts background, some kind of, um, you know, just a myth storytelling. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell a story about a friendship between two friends and one of the main characters happens to be Asian. And I wanted to center it around that because I didn't want my character to have any special magic powers, any, any superpowers, etc. Because I just felt that from a representation perspective, we also want to see Asian lead characters just being themselves. And I think that's made a huge difference, especially from a lot of the comments we've gotten in our YouTube channel, how a lot of our viewers 
have said, oh my gosh, this is such a great short film, but it's so good to see, you know, an Asian representation in this way because you don't really see it at all in that sense. So for me, that's really inspiring to see. And I hope that, you know, other filmmakers will also consider taking the path of, you know, having the characters of people of color because we need more of it. We, if we don't see it enough to break, this, of course, the stereotypical roles that we see in Hollywood. I think that's a wonderful answer. One of the things that I noticed about the film was that you you made a point of the shading of the skin tone for both characters. And uh, they both have a, a, a bit of a warm tone to their skin. And you, you see how they develop over time. As they go from young and continue to grow, you see their skin color and the shading change as well. And it's a very subtle thing. But I noticed it uh, probably after my fourth time watching the film. So, so was that was that on purpose? That actually is on purpose, and I'm so glad you noticed it. Um, there was a lot of detail and love put into this short film, and one of those details was what you just highlighted, which is the color of the the skin in in regards to as they age. Hmm. And you will also notice that towards the end, they also have you know um, I would say age marks right on their arm and etc. Yeah. Hmm. Because that's that's a true representation, of course, how we age as human beings. So yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do a little pixel peeping every now and then to see how far I can, <laughs> how far down I can go. So we're we're here at at Clark Atlanta University. We have some young uh, filmmakers in the audience. Um, being that you got out here, you did this. You moved from the tech side, and this is now a, a critically acclaimed and an award winning film. Any advice that you'd have for some of our filmmakers in the audience? Yeah, you know, my advice to you guys is um, I would just start creating things. I wouldn't wait for permission. We're at a point in technology where you can distribute your own, you know, content, right? We have platforms such as, of course, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, etc., to to really have your artwork, your content shown to the world. I think the days of waiting, especially waiting for permission, is is long gone. Um, I think now we have to take our own action. We have to take our own, I would say, destiny in our own hands to make things happen. Especially today where we're seeing so many layoffs, it's, it's in, in tech particularly and in the entertainment industry, it makes you realize that what you may think is a safe, stable job in a corporate career really may be a false illusion because that stability only lasts for a certain point. But if you create your own content, your content is yours forever. It doesn't matter. It will always live you know, on the platforms. And it gives you an avenue to meeting other people as well as going to various film festivals if you're doing short films or even other festivals, just to meet like-minded people. It's really important to find your tribe. And that's the whole point of when you're creating your own content. You're creating your own content to tell your own stories, but more importantly, to find your tribe who you can bring along as well. That's great advice. Great advice. So um, anything you want to say before we get to a little bit of Q&A from the audience? You know, I also want to touch upon AI animation. That's another um, area that we're exploring and, and playing with right now. Uh, AI animation is definitely going to change the way the industry will be, and not just in animation, but across various industries. But the difference is this, is that it's going to be really important for, for you to start learning AI, regardless of what industry you are in, because it is going to disrupt any industry, particularly in animation. When we're talking about character designs, backgrounds, lighting, etc., it's going to be a big impact. And you want to be on the train now when it's early stage versus waiting, delaying, postponing 
Because by the time that you're waiting and delaying, the train has passed and you're playing catch up. So for those who are really interested in AI animation, I would suggest you start taking classes, classes even on YouTube that are free. There's a whole bunch of free uh, places that you can learn about AI. AI is not going away. What's gonna end up happening is just going to ramp up more quickly. And that would be my suggestion is just don't look at the tools you've learned from school, but you need to learn beyond the tools from school. And this is one of them, which is the AI tools. Yeah, you and I had great conversations about that and also about the work that you're doing online with your company to educate individuals about the new pipeline. Um, you want to talk about some of the some of the more recent things that you found uh, interesting Um Yes. You know, one of the most interesting things we've seen is what you could do with AI, meaning I could take an image, just a static image, and then I can upload, you know, an audio and AI could do the entire facial animation as well as the lip syncing within a matter of seconds, which is, you know, insane considering the fact that most of us from the animation industry know how long it really takes to lip sync, to, to do the animation, et cetera. And now it can be done within seconds. Another thing we've noticed is with the workflow pipeline, what we know as the you know normal workflow pipeline of scripts, then storyboards and characters, et cetera, is now greatly changed. You don't need to do it in that order because of AI. You can actually go through a real-time animation progress much faster. That way you're not wasting, I would say, time in regards to trying to figure out how it may look, while in AI, you could see it in real time. And that's going to be a huge difference in how content will be produced. There's going to be a lot of time shaved of waiting where now we're going to be able to see it instantly. And that's going to be another big shift in mindset and how people work. Yeah, I think that's really important. One of the things that you really drove home is that we should be looking at uh, these AI tools as tools and uh, to, to remove some of the fear. There are individuals who are fearful that this may replace jobs, but I, I personally see this as creating new jobs. And once you understand how these tools work, that's really the angle that can help you, uh, you know, extend your livelihood. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, I, I see it as a companion, right? Yeah. It's AI tools are, are different tools you can use to help you with what you already are doing. It'll just make it faster. I think there will be new jobs, of course, that will come out of AI. But I do feel that if you already have the skills in it, it'll just enhance what you're doing much faster. That's great. Well, I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to take a walk to find out if we have any questions from our, our attendees. Okay, hold on one second. We've got one question. <laughs> Congratulations on your success. My question is, what did you find most challenging to doing your short? Was it just getting started? Was it finding the resources, getting in the right set of mind? What was most challenging to you? That's a great question. I'm so glad you, you, you asked that question. You know what I found the most hardest was the mindset shift. I had to change how I was thinking. And what I mean by that is I had to believe that I could do it as opposed to waiting for somebody to, to be like, okay, Lynn, here you go. Now you could do it. I had to give myself my own permission to do it. And once I had that mindset shift, then I was able to take action. Like the fear fell aside and I was able to think about, okay, what do I need to do next? So for me, the next thing I had to do was I had to write a script. And after I wrote the script, I was like, okay, what do I need to do next? You know, next thing was, oh, character designs, then the storyboard. It was always thinking about what was in front of me. And then right after that, the next step would appear. 
And I think sometimes a lot of us, we have the fear of not even knowing where to begin, how to start. And I think sometimes the most simplest and easiest thing to do is to see just what's in front of you and just be like, okay, well, if I could just open up, you know, a Google doc and just write four lines or five lines, that's great. That's a start. And I think as you build that, you begin to build the momentum, you begin to build your self-confidence. And then slowly you begin to realize that, oh my gosh, I could do this. And you begin attracting other people who also believe in your vision. Such a great answer. Do we have any other questions? Hold on, we got another question, Len. Okay. So you mentioned uh, using AI to uh, begin the animation process. Uh, what advice do you have to the students regarding uh, rights management and protecting their rights to the content that they might use AI, open AI, to, uh, to create animated content? So if you're using AI to create your characters, you don't really have any copyright control because AI is a mod podge of a bunch of other data that's being scraped that has created the characters. Um, that in itself is, you know, something that as we all have seen in the media is still being played out. I would suggest using AI in regards to already if you have your characters that you have created. Right. And then you already have the voiceovers and then you can use AI to help sync the workflow production process. I think if you're just trying to create your original IP, I would not use AI because AI is a mixture of everyone's IP that they were able to scrape for the large language models to create. And so I would tread very, very carefully on that. With friendship, friendship is all, um, you know, human made. There was no AI at all because at the time when friendship was created, AI was not released yet. After the short film was released six months later, you know, ChatGPT came out. So it was a different, it was a different segment of, of I would say, creation at that time than what it is now. So, but my, my advice is tread very lightly if you're trying to create your own IP using AI. All right, we've got time for one more if there's uh, any more questions. All right, Len, thank you so much. It's good to see you again, my friend, and uh, we'll be talking. So I'll let you start thank your you. day, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to the, next, uh, the next chapter of your story. Okay, thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Bye. I believe I mentioned that today was going to be a very impactful and education, educational day. Did I lie? I don't, I don't think I did. Uh, these speakers, every one of them were amazing. Um, gave us a lot to think about, hopefully talk about at dinner. Hope everyone's coming. Um, I'd say one of the more powerful statements that I heard or themes that I heard from several speakers were make it happen, was make it happen. It's a different time now. Um, while a seat at the table is great, if you can get it, uh, make your own seat uh, in your own table. Work with, um, as Lynn was saying, uh, find your tribe. Uh, when you find amazing people to work with, there's so much you can do. So, um, and I, I found those people in grad school and undergrad, and we still work together to this day. So um, make the connections with your, with your fellow students as you can and make make it happen. So before we make dinner happen, um, please, I just want to say please join us tomorrow for day two. We start at 930 and we'll dive deep into color workflows, video gaming, AI, and the future in general. Someone please confirm where dinner will be. Okay.